Uh, I can't see my, can't get it. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Our community is filled with diverse stories and uh, we recognize that our story begins with the indigenous peoples of this land. Uh, we acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia. And we would like to honor the centuries of in, uh, indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. Hi everyone, my name is Adrian, Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. I'm so excited to welcome our own Sarah Nixon, public programmer, to deliver tonight's lecture. Thank you for joining us uh, for the virtual museum lecture series. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. Uh, a quick reminder for those of you watching through mobile devices, please check your audio settings in the YouTube app if you're having any audio problems. You may also not have access to the chat box, so you can always post comments or questions in the regular comments below the video. Please also welcome, sorry, the dog is <laughs> gonna make some noise. Um, okay, there we go. The joys of working from home. Uh, please, also wel uh, please also feel welcome to ask questions in the chat box and we'll moderate them at the end of the presentation. Before I hand it off to Sarah, let me remind everyone that, <laughs> sorry, Jarvis, sit down. Okay, here we go. Say hi to Jarvis, everybody, okay. Um, before I hand it off to Sarah, let, re let me remind everyone of our exciting lecture lineup for the winter of 2021. Uh, first, I should quickly mention that our programming celebrating Black History Month continues on February 21st here on YouTube with a live virtual tour, um, with the live virtual tour of the museum's Follow the North Star exhibit at 4.30 p.m. You can catch it by emailing the museum for the link or by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking the little bell for alerts. On March 2nd, I will be here with a talk about our city's urban development titled No Exit, The Dead End Streets of St. Catharines. On March 16th, our curator Kathleen Powell will be on to discuss the Boer War and our local participation in her talk titled For King and Country. On March 30th, we're very excited to welcome local geographer and former Brock University map librarian, Colleen Beard, to talk about the uh, historic Welling Canals mapping project. And then on April 13th, we're also very excited to welcome students from the Brock University Historical Society to present a mini symposium of recent undergraduate work. And finally, on April 27th, we'll close our winter session of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series with a very special guest, author and historian at the Canadian War Museum, Dr. Tim Cook, who will give a talk about remembering the Second World War and his new book, The Fight for History. And, we're already working on a lineup for the fall of 2021. If you have a topic you'd like to see presented as a part of the series, please send us a note and we'll try to include it. And if you don't, we're gonna send out a survey. So <laughs> uh, do send us your ideas and what you'd like to see. Uh, otherwise you have to fit out, fill out a survey. I sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying our virtual museum lecture series. Might I encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you've come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Please give us a call at 905-984-8880 and leave a message or send us an email at museum at stcatherines.ca to make a donation. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. And without further ado, I'm very happy to welcome Sarah to the lecture. Take it away, Sarah. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I'm really excited to be here. So let's get started. Okay, so my official title here at the St. Catharines Museum is Public Programmer. 
And when people inevitably ask what public programmer means, I usually explain that I am a good mix of museum educator, history nerd, museum interpreter, public historian, or simply museum worker. Whatever my official title is, at the heart of what I do is to spark meaningful, impactful connection between people and the past. And there are challenges that come with interpreting history within a museum setting, or as a museum, interpreting history out in the public. And our team consciously, consciously strives to actively address these challenges in our work. And one such challenge is, in, is encountering the public's expectations, perceptions, and preconceived narratives of history before they even arrive to us. Visitors to the St. Catharines Museum already have an idea of the Welland Canal before they walk onto the viewing platform. But it's about how we can turn this experience into something meaningful. As a museum, we gather a broad sense of the preconceived narratives of history that our visitors might have already encountered so that we can use these as tools to connect with visitors at their level, but then also engage them with new stories and perspectives of that history. It's a balancing act. However, some stories like Black history are more emotional and difficult than others, and the stakes seem higher to get it right. When people hear about St. Catherine's Black history, they often come to expect a story of Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. And that the narrative is so deeply tied to the Underground Railroad is problematic as it greatly overshadows the history of the city's Black community after the American Civil War and into the 20th century. But even more problematic is that the Underground Railroad narrative that so many of us are familiar with is brimming with romanticized myth. And people have come to expect the myth. The Underground Railroad legend is incredibly vivid in our collective imagination. So imagine for a moment the Underground Railroad. Let me paint a picture of what likely sparked your mind. A dangerous journey of refugee slaves escaping bondage in the Southern United States with the brave guidance of conductors and access to safe hiding places and depots, freedom seekers made their way on the metaphorical tracks of the Underground Railroad to the final terminus of freedom, hope, and a new life in Northern US and Canada. <clears throat> now these have all elements of what we love in a good story. We always like a story that has a clear cut hero and villain. The conductors are often written as the heroes, white abolitionists, though sometimes free black folk who used the attics or cellars of their homes, barns or secret tunnels as depots for the scared and desperate slaves they were morally committed to helping. And the villain in the Underground Railroad story is, of course, the Southern planter or the slave owner and their greedy, deceitful accomplices, bounty hunters, who scheme to catch slaves for high monetary reward. We also like a story with adventure and excitement. And so we are drawn to the premise of slaves and abolitionists risking their lives and facing unimaginable danger, venturing across slave states under cover or in the dead of night, outrunning or hiding from bounty hunters and taking whatever means necessary to cross the very real obstacles to freedom. And above all else, we all like a story with a happy ending and the story of the Underground Railroad inevitably always ends with the freedom seekers crossing into Canada, the promised land, and settling into a free and prosperous life. But like any story, 
any good story, especially one that has been told over and over again, over many generations, the story of the Underground Railroad has become exaggerated over time. And with exaggeration, eventually comes the creation of folklore, legend, and myth. And this is what people have come to expect today. In tonight's lecture, I'd like to unpack some of the myths surrounding the Underground Railroad. Now, I'm not saying that the history of the Underground Railroad does not have its heroes or villains or adventure worth telling. Rather, I hope that by giving these myths a bit more scrutiny, we can shift our attention from the classic storytelling tropes that have romanticized our understanding of the Underground Railroad and instead center the narrative on the courage and fortitude of the Black men and women who made the escape and who put their lives in danger as they sought freedom. Furthermore, I want to consider how, as a museum, we can address visitors' expectations of this romanticized happy ending narrative. Now, before I get too much farther, I do want to acknowledge the sources I'll be drawing from. My scrutiny and reflections surrounding the myths of the Underground Railroad are not entirely groundbreaking. I draw on the academic research of Larry Guerra and David Blight, as well as more mainstream works like the 2013 PBS documentary, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross with Henry Louis Gates Jr., among others. And these people have tirelessly muddled through the bloated myths of the railroad to recenter the story on the Black experience. And I will use this research to take a closer look at how these legends have woven themselves into the St. Catharines narrative. It is also worth acknowledging the obvious fact that I am white. I am a white museum worker studying Black history and sharing Black history with the public. And almost all of our museum staff and volunteer docents who interpret Black history are also white. Now, I acknowledge that it is incredibly important to share the museum's platform with people of color, to share authority and to share the narrative when telling the history of racialized folks in our community. And while there is always work to do and improvements to be made, the museum is taking significant strides to include more voices in the stories we share of the history of our community. However, it is not productive for us to place the burden on people of color to do all of the work and all of the teaching. And I cannot beh hide behind my whiteness to hide from responsibility. So when I interpret any aspect of St. Catherine's history to the public, I take accountability, I open dialogue and strive to share as diverse range of perspectives and experiences as I can based in the historical accounts and credible source, sources available to us. So when I speak of the Underground Railroad myth or, or legend, I am referring to the romantic idea of a centrally organized secret cross-border network of abolitionists, safe places and routes intricately working together to safely spirit slaves away from bondage and into Canada. However, the historical sources available to us re reveal that a slave's escape to freedom was not as clear cut. No centralized organization existed. And what was known as the Underground Railroad was much more likely a loosely linked series of local networks across the northern United States and into Canada that sometimes coordinated and sometimes didn't, that sometimes involved the aid and careful planning of specific abolitionists, but also sometimes relied on snap judgment and quick thinking and throwing the plan entirely away due to unforeseen dangers or circumstances. In fact, of the slaves that did successfully escape from bondage, most were primarily dependent on their own resources and fortitude, 
learning quickly to trust very few who offer their aid. Much of contemporary misunderstanding and myth about the Underground Railroad originated with the 1898 study published by histor history, or historian and professor Wilbur H. Siebert um, with his study titled The Underground Railroad from Slavery to Freedom. Through the 1880s and 1890s, some 30 years after the peak of the Underground Railroad and the American Civil War, Siebert collected an impressively vast array of material regarding the Underground Railroad. He wrote letters of inquiry to aged abolitionists and their descendants asking to complete a questionnaire. He interviewed former freedom seekers and nearly everyone still living who had some memory, some memory related to the network. Now these reminiscences formed the source material for his widely published study. Now, while we must acknowledge Siebert's extensive and diligent work here, we must all also acknowledge that what he was collecting were in fact reminiscences. Recall to Siebert decades after the Underground Railroad activity ended, like all good stories told time and time again, what was shared was more likely family lore. Think about a story that you were told as a child by your parent or grandparent about something that happened when they were children. Details are inevitably left out or embellished due to memory or otherwise. In the case of a Siebert study, it was only after the Civil War ended and slavery abolished that the anti-slavery cause actually earned nationwide respectability in American society. So aging abolitionists became eager to stake their claim on the right side of history. They wanted their credit. The recollections submitted to Siebert or even local historians in other studies they emphasize the abolitionist heroism and loyalty, telling thrilling tales that drew more on propaganda of the time rather than being grounded in lived experience. And these tales of adventure were already told to their children, relatives and neighbors, and they would in turn, and out of loyalty, recount these stories to their descendants and on and on and on. So these were the tales that made it not only into Siebert's study, but also into local and county history publications, further embedding the legend into popular conscious. Now, thankfully, Siebert sifted past the most fanciful of stories that he received, but still in what he did publish, it placed far too much emphasis on the work of self-described white conductors managing these interconnected stations and routes across the United States. And historians who have studied his source material actually argue that Siebert selected the accounts that fed into his romanticized narrative of the Underground Railroad and chose not to include accounts that did not make any mention of the network or who outright, outrightly denied a knowledge of it. And in doing so, Siebert's 1898 publication, it fashioned this popular narrative of primarily white conductors helping nameless black folks to freedom. And this over time embedded itself in the popular conscience of the United States, inevitably spreading into Canada. Now, despite Siebert's selective history, his work still powerfully influences both scholarly and popular conceptions of the Underground Railroad today. The romanticized narrative is especially appealing to communities who have rallied around their local Underground Railroad connections as points of community pride or even to increase local tourism. So the legend is then weaved into local history books and on walking tours and tourist attractions, and even in museums. 
And the story becomes so established a pillar of community identity that it becomes incredibly challenging to present an alternate historical narrative that calls into question largely held assumptions. Now, the myths of the Underground Railroad are incredibly wide reaching in our popular conscious and collective understanding of the past. Think even to my image selection for this lecture's promotional graphic that we see right here. I wanted to use something from the museum collection in the promotional graphic, uh, but I recognize that um, we have very few artifacts directly connected to the Underground Railroad. So I selected this image of an old cabin dated in 1937 for no other reason than it resonated with the narrative that most of us have internalized. And we can associate this outbuilding with a chronicle of a scared, desperate fugitive slave hiding in a deserted barn, evading bounty hunters and planning their next move uh, on their dangerous journey to freedom. But this building, however, that I'm showing, it's simply just an old log cabin. It was located on a farm in Louth Township, uh, the Woodruff Farm to be specific, and no known Underground Railroad connections exist. Um, but this draws from the same narrative that's brimming with railroad metaphors and code words, uh, conductors, guides, who are usually white, but sometimes black abolitionists. Uh, a station is a community supporting the anti-slavery cause. Depots are slave houses, safe houses rather, and or hiding places. Tracks mean route. Cargo refers to slaves. The terminus or means the North, usually Northern United States or in Canada. And, even my approach to interpreting Underground Railroad history at the St. Catharines Museum, both to adults and to school children, heavily relies on these railroad metaphors. Such symbolism and Im imagery are really effective tools to describe this really complicated and layered history that had many historical players and moving pieces to connect this to the public. And it's important that my audience can connect to the history that I share at the museum. That's how history can make a meaningful impact. However, I must also balance hooking my audience with the story and delving into the complexities and nuances of the historical topic. Furthermore, I try to establish at the onset of whatever tour of, of, or program I'm delivering, what the Underground Railroad really was. Over the decades, myths have spurred around the notion that operatives aiding freedom seekers communicated using railway terminology as code words when transiting refugees to freedom. The fact is, however, that the real operation of the Underground Railroad was not the highly organized system of conductors, tunnels, codes, or clearly defined tracks and stations that popular lore has led us to believe. It was not a nationwide scheme or conspiracy. Rather, the Underground Railroad was the series of localized networks operated by a few abolitionists, who sometimes operated together and sometimes not, using a vast range of methods or resources available to aid slaves escaping bondage. And some who helped were even more motivated by personal gain rather than moral compass. We have records of some attempting to make money off of freedom seekers who were in very desperate situations. Even truer still, and most important of all, many slaves who did escape fled on their own without guidance and resources and were wary to trust others for fear of being caught, instead relying on their own fortitude and grit. Now the use of the term Underground Railroad, it can be traced back into the 19th or the 1830s, sorry. Um, here I have a, a image on the slide of um, an 
of the Liberty Line advertisement. This was 1844. An advertisement was published in the Chicago Western Citizen that you see here for the Liberty Line. So first, this clearly was not secret if it was published in a newspaper as an ad. <laughs> um, but the ad, it addressed a card to the Friends of the Underground Railroad in Jersey County, Illinois, and claimed that the Underground Railroad was in, quote, excellent order. It quotes, the station keepers and superintendents are all active and trustworthy men and chattels entrusted in their care will be forwarded with great care and unparalleled speed. About a month after this cartoon you see here was published in the same paper showing an underground train with its cargo of happy ex slaves on their way to Canada. And beneath this drawing, you can read that there is this humorous description of a quote, improved and splendid locomotives and quote, best style passenger accommodations for those who quote, may who may wish to improve their health, health and circumstances by a Northern tour. So advertisements like these that were published at the peak of the Underground Railroad or just before in 1840s, these were used to foster intrigue into the work of abolitionists and to taunt pro-slavery factions. This sort of language, it trickled down through generations and is recounted in histories like Siebert's 1898 study. Even William Still, who is a fame or what a famed African American abolitionist adopted railroad railway metaphors in his 1872 publication, The Underground Railroad Records, and it's very long subtitle, a record of facts, authentic narratives and letters narrating the hardships, hair breath escapes and death struggles of the slaves in their efforts for freedom as related by themselves and others or witnessed by the author together with sketches of some of the largest stockholders and most liberal aiders and advisors of the road. Publishing the accounts of former slaves and abolitionists still repeatedly refers to passengers, station master, masters, depots, and conductors in his work. Furthermore, works of fiction like Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin have borrowed from the legend, added to it, and helped to popularize it. And even contemporary fiction continues to feed into this myth. In 2016, Colson Whitehead published a Pulitzer Prize winning fictionalized account of the Underground Railroad in which the railroad is real in every sense of the term engineers and conductors operating a se secret network of actual tracks and tunnels beneath the soil of the Southern US. Now this novel is a number one New York Times bestseller and an Oprah's book club selection. But despite the use of this language to describe anti-slavery activity and afterwards, there is very little evidence that an established code of railway metaphors was used as a method of communication between operators and users of the Underground Railroad. A system of code words or any organized system at all ran the risk of being cracked by bounty hunters of, and slave owners. In post-war publications that compiled the personal accounts of former slaves, a number, like Sieber's study, but also other local histories, um, a number of those interviewed had never actually heard of the Underground Railroad, and a number more recalled receiving very little aid from others at all. Understanding the danger of escape, it was very difficult to determine who could be trusted once on the run and which routes were safe to take. It's also impossible to confirm how many slaves escaped to freedom. This gap in the historical record is not because of the secrecy of the Underground Railroad, but because the conflicting records of the time exaggerated the numbers for different reasons. Abolitionists exaggerated the numbers to emphasize their own heroism and the Black desire for freedom 
while slavery supporters use this as evidence of the Northern conspiracy to undermine the slave owning South as a whole, and also to exaggerate their personal claims of property and labor loss. More likely estimates range from about 1,000 to 5,000 freedom seekers per year between 1830 and 1850 who escaped. However, this range is still quite small considering that the slave population in the United States reached about 4 million by the year 1860. Now, families and communities leveraging the excitement of such popularized history focus or effort to stake their claim in the narrative. Drawing on the secretive nature of the Underground Railroad, communities in the northern U.S. and here in Canada have attributed hidden tunnels or secret rooms in old, in old homes as proof that their town was once a headquarters for abolitionists or hosted safe houses for freedom seekers, rallying around this idea that they are on the right side of history. And here in St. Catharines, we have our, our fair share of secret hiding place lore. Take for example, the documented tunnels that once existed under Oak Hill, the residence of William Hamilton Merritt, now a radio station since the 1930s. Now, since little historical record exists to explain what these tunnels were used for, local folklore has taken its place. Merritt was a known abolitionist. He sold land to freedom seekers settling in St. Catharines and was a key organizer in St. Catharines local abolitionist group, the Refugee Slaves Friends Society. Now, spurring from these historical facts over time, a myth claiming the tunnels were used to transport and safeguard freedom seekers on the Underground Railroad materialized. Now, you may also be interested to know that these same tunnels are also the subject of another legend that alleges rum runners use the tunnels to sneak illegal alcohol from boats on the canal into the building during Prohibition in the early 1900s. But neither myth is substantiated with evidence and the timelines don't quite match up anyways. The tunnels under this house, they're dated back to about 1860, 61, uh, during the second reconstruction of the house after it was damaged by fire. Now this is about a decade after the peak of the freedom seeker movement into St. Catharines. And this is also well before prohibition. It is most likely that these tunnels were a way to transport legal goods from boats down below the bank of 12 Mile Creek and the Welland Canal up into the house, since it was quite a distance and the hill was quite steep. And another theory suggests that the tunnels carried sewage or drainage services down the hill. Now these tunnels were filled in in 1967, but were recently re rediscovered during the large overhaul project on the Burgoyne Bridge, and this reignited the legend. Now, myth and legend are often perpetuated by some truth, and there are accounts of refugee slaves that have at some point somewhere found themselves moving through a tunnel or hiding in cupboards or other secret places in homes and buildings to evade bounty hunters. And I'm also not saying that it was not dangerous for freedom seekers once they reached the Northern US or even in Canada. The threat of being caught by bounty hunters was very real, especially after the passing of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. So access to a secure hideaway was probably a good thing to have. The historical record confirms that slave owners and bounty hunters even crossed the border into Niagara to, in attempts to recapture former slaves. Take the experience of Solomon Mosby, for example. He was living in Niagara-on-the-Lake in 1837 when his former slave owner came, came to this town to very publicly demand for his arrest. Now, this is different than outright kidnapping. 
And also the community did not hide Mosby. Instead, they rallied around him to publicly protest his extradition. Mosby successfully escaped the situation. The evidence that does exist tells us that there were not as many safe houses with secret hideaways and attics or cellars or these secret passageways that the legend says. And furthermore, records suggest that some refugee slaves used other inventive methods of escape that did not rely on the underground railroad network at all. Take for example, uh, the carefully planned escape of William and Ellen Craft of Georgia. Using money stowed away, light-skinned Ellen disguised herself as an ailing slave-owning planter traveling north for medical treatment. She was hard, she played, pretended to be hard of hearing and in an obviously decrepit physical condition. So the planter was accompanied by his faithful servant slave to depend on throughout the journey. This of course was William. They made sure to travel first class on trains and steamboats, stopping only at respectable hotels to uphold the facade and it worked. Opting to hide in plain sight, William and Ellen successfully made it to freedom in Boston, relying solely on their own courage and ingenuity. Others still escaped on their own under the cover of darkness, trusting very few as they relied on their own grit and courage to move from place to place headed north. Woven into the Underground Railroad legend are other methods of communicating secret passages, secret messages and coding escape instructors for freedom seekers to follow. The legend goes that if slaves could not be directly aided by an abolitionist on their journey, they knew they could find guidance through other means, including song and freedom quilts. Similar to the metaphorical railroad, popular fiction loves the colorful romantic imagery of large quilts hanging outside an abolitionist's home or made by slaves. Patterned with symbols, coding directions and instructions for escaping slaves to use. Unfortunately, there are no, there's just simply no evidence of the use of symbols and quilts to guide slaves on the route to freedom. Historians have analyzed written accounts and interviews of escaped slaves, biographies and autobiographies, and have found no such mention of a quilt system. And again, any method to widely share escape plans or instructions would have run the risk of being uncovered by bounty hunters or slave owners. If a slave family had the resources uh, resources or, or time to make a quilt, it would have more likely been used as a protection against the cold rather than as a message board full of symbols to display. Now, upon a bit of digging, the legend of the freedom quilt seems to have begun with the book Hidden in Plain Sight. Oh, sorry, Hidden in Plain View, published by in 1999 by Jacqueline Tobin and Professor Raymond G. DeBard. This book itself draws on oral history tradition and the long history of using quilts as a mean of storytelling in some West African cultures that was brought over into the Americas through the slave trade. However, the book presents symbolism as historical truth, drawing on all sorts of local lore and storytelling to weave together this picture of a secret quilt code and its use during the Underground Railroad. Now I'm not discrediting the rich tradition of storytelling through quilt patterns and its cultural significance, but I do want to scrutinize the myth that slaves across plantations in the South knew to widely communicate with each other through quilts and knew to pass these down to family members and to look for escape instructions in these quilts. The power of myth is quite stark in this example. The Freedom Quilt legend was only published some 20 years ago, but has very quickly seeped into our popular conscious. 
think even to uh, Harriet Tubman Public School here in St. Catharines, they opened in 2015 and proudly tie school spirit with popular ideas of the Underground Railroad and the Freedom Quilt. The North Stars, as they call themselves, uh, their, their school colors include a deep blue, which is said to be a traditional base color of the Freedom Quilts, and the lockers that line the school hallways are painted in vibrant color schemes reminiscent of these quilts. Now, to be sure, I do not want to take away from the immense pride Harriet Tubman Public School instills in their students and the emphasis the school places on Black history education. The students from the school who have participated in the museum's Black history programming are so proud of their knowledge of the Underground Railroad and are always so excited to tell, to tell me how their school celebrates uh, Black history and their history with, with me, with with their community. But I, I wanna share this as an example of how quickly a myth can penetrate our understanding of history and how challenging it can be to unlearn these romanticized versions of the past. Now, in addition to the lack of evidence, the narr this narrative tool, again, takes away from the agency of the Black folks who chose to seek freedom despite the danger and risk. It makes assumptions that escaping slaves had more support and were more prepared with resources and tools than an actual experience. Now, this is similar to another well-known myth, the coded messages of enslaved spirituals. Song was an important element of the slave culture on plantations in the Southern US. And the spiritual song helped to form what little sense of belonging, identity, and community that slaves could share, lifting morale and lifting spirit. Like oral tradition, spirituals would have likely been passed down, passed between slaves, as well as down through generations. One of the most famous of these songs is Follow the Drinking Gourd, which, according to legend, encodes escape instructions and a map to the north, where the drinking gourd refers to the Big Dipper Star Formation, which points to the North Star. So I'm going to attempt to have us listen to the song, just a little bit of it. I'm going to put this up on my phone and put my phone against my speaker. Hopefully this works out. When the sun comes back and the first quail calls, all Okay, I wanted to give that a listen to give you an idea of what the lyrics were like. Now, this folk song was officially published in 1928, though it very well could have been sung by slaves on plantations. But as with the origins of most folk songs, little historical record exists. However, if this song, if this song was sung by slaves, it was more likely sung as a means to raise spirits, offer inspiration, and perhaps even a guiding principle for escape rather than providing direct, concrete, widely used escape instructions. While these spirituals were passed orally from slave to slave, there is again no evidence that songs were used to help others escape or even to encourage escape across plantations. This is for the same reason railway code words and quilts were not used out of fear of being caught. 
Furthermore, the signature line of the song, quote, and I won't sing this, for the old man is awaiting to carry you to freedom, unquote, this was written by a man named, a man named Lee Hayes in 1947. This is more than 40 years after the end of the Civil War. And this in itself is another strong reminder that lore, including folk songs, they change and evolve over time as they are told by more people and spread more widely. Other spirituals that are said to have connection to the Underground Railroad are Go Down Moses, Steal Away to Jesus, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Wade in the Water, to name a few. Go Down Moses supposedly describes Harriet Tubman's journey to rescue slaves. And while myths have spurred around the others, that these two contained hidden messages and escape instructions. However, similar to Follow the Drinking Gourd, these gospel songs uh, were likely, may have likely been sung by slaves and passed down through generations, but the evidence lacks to prove that they were used in such a very specific way. Freedom quilts and folk songs, like the railroad metaphors, these are effective tools in teaching Underground Railroad history and for sharing credible, credible stories of the experiences of freedom seekers in museums and classrooms or in popular culture. But they should be vehicles for storytelling rather than the center of the story. The freedom quilts made today by community members, for example, or the singing of songs like Follow the Drinking Gourd, these can be a medium to share a much more layered history. Now, while I do not want to make sweeping statements, very few slaves who escaped had any sort of education and had little knowledge of the world beyond where they lived in bondage. Instead, they relied on knowledge cultivated amongst themselves and through oral tradition. For example, oral tradition would have passed down knowledge of the stars and constellations. And freedom seekers would have used this knowledge of the, of the night sky uh, to guide themselves when on the run. With only their fortitude to rely on and knowing that freedom lay north, freedom seekers knew that they could trust the North Star at night. And this could have been the inspiration for the Follow the Drinking Gourd song, but freedom seekers could not rely on there being an old man waiting to carry them to freedom and focusing the narrative on quilts, folk songs, and other aids like looking for lanterns and windows. These take away from the actual intuition and agency of freedom seekers. Abolitionists certainly played a vital role in the anti-slavery movement and Underground Railroad activity. However, the myths perpetuated through post-Civil War literature unfairly centers the hero heroism of the narrative on abolitionists, particularly white abolitionists, rather than on the freedom seekers themselves. Though white abolitionists like Levi Coffin or Thomas Garrett worked tirelessly to aid refugee slaves, there were also a number of white abolitionists who were against the idea of breaking the law to help these slaves escape. Furthermore, historical evidence suggests that most people who aided freedom seekers were free Black individuals or former slaves themselves. Similar tensions were felt here in St. Catharines at the height of the Underground Railroad in the 1850s. Freedom seekers were drawn to St. Catharines because the abolitionist movement was so strong here. The Refugee Slaves Friends Society was established in April 1852 as a direct response to the outpouring of support and fundraising efforts to benefit the refugees coming and settling in St. Catharines. 
But it must be kept in mind that the organization was formed also because there were factions of the community who were against abolition, for one, as at the time slavery would have only been abolished in Canada about 18 years ago. And at the very least, members of the community were simply not comfortable with aiding and supporting refugee slaves who were seen as fugitives breaking the law in the United States. Um, and they weren't comfortable with aiding these fugitives coming into Canada. At the same time, in April 1852, at that same meeting in which the Refugee Slaves Friends Society was officially formed, the St. Catharines Journal reported later that there were attempts by some young whites to disturb the meeting, that's a quote, and that a call was made, quote, for the mayor to provide a police constable to prevent such dis disruptions in the future, end quote. So there were those tensions that exist in St. Catharines. While white abolitionists and organizations like the Refugee Slaves Friends Society in St. Catharines made valuable contributions to advocate and support for freedom seekers arriving in the town, the Black community that grew here thrived as a result of their own agency, independence, and determination. When settling in the underdeveloped area around what is now North Street and Geneva Streets in the 1820s and 1830s, freedom seekers raised their own funds to purchase land from white abolitionists, William Hamilton Merritt and Oliver Phelps. In 1835, they purchased property to build their own chapel. And when the community outgrew this small church, the community again raised funds to build a new, much larger church. This is the Salem Chapel BME Church that stands today, and that's pictured here. Contrary to popular myth, Harriet Tubman did not build this church. But in fact, freedom seekers with carpentry skills built the structure themselves. And the congregation at the BME church provided a shelter and aid to the newly arrived freedom seekers until the end of the Civil War. And this was where neighbors gathered and celebrated together. The people of Colored Town were free and the community helped one another carry out the duties of being responsible citizens, like finding employment and housing, paying taxes, caring for fa family, education. The agency and determination that got freedom seekers to St. Catharines helped them thrive here. To highlight the success of this community on our tours, the museum often refers to this detailed description written by William Wells Brown. He writes of, quote, the Colored Settlement. The Colored Settlement is a hamlet situated on the outskirts of the village and contains about 100 houses, 40 of which lie on North Street, the Broadway of the place. The houses are chiefly cottages with three to six rooms and on lots of land nearly a quarter of an acre each. Each family has a good garden, well filled with vegetables, ducks, chickens, and a pig pen with at least one fat grunter getting ready for Christmas. The houses with the lots upon which they stand are worth up to are worth upon average about $500 each. The houses in the settlement are all owned by their occupants. And from inquiry, I learned that the people were generally free from debt. Out of the 800 in St. Catharines, about 700 of them are fugitive slaves. Among them, I found 17 carpenters, four blacksmiths, six coopers and five shoemakers, two omnibuses and two hacks are driven by colored men, unquote. The history of the Underground Railroad doesn't end once freedom seekers reach freedom in the North, the final terminus or the promised land. No, to center the story on the Black experience means to extend the narrative to life after slavery, what was it like to settle in an entirely new place as a free person and to build a full free life? 
popular legend tells us that once slaves found freedom, all was well. The story ends and they lived happily ever after. However, we know that this was not the case. Through legal, though legally free, Black folks, they, they faced discrimination and racism in the Northern US and in Canadian communities that they settled in. The legacy of slavery continued to follow them into their free lives. And the museum has begun to scrutinize this more closely in recent years. Adrian and I, we delved in, into detail around the discrimination that freedom seekers experienced in St. Catharines in a virtual lecture that we delivered in November of last year. You can find this on our YouTube channel. We discuss an American report written by Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, known as the Howe Report, which wrote on the conditions of refugee freedom seekers living in Canada, including St. Catharines, uh, to the United States Congress. And this report reveals that the Black community living in St. Catharines did face systematic and some and both systematic and subtle discrimination in both employment and education opportunities, social inclusion, and housing. A collection of interviews published by abolitionist Benjamin Drew in 1856 does the same work. In his work, uh, A North Side View of Slavery, the Refugee or the Narratives of Fugitive Slaves in Canada also reveals these experiences of discrimination. You can find more detail about the experiences that Drew collected from St. Catharines in a blog series published on the St. Catharines Museum blog back in 2017. Now, centering Black experience and how we tell the history of the Underground Railroad complicates the neatly wrapped package that has been so deeply embedded in our popular conscious. We must embrace the messy, layered histories that emerge when the narrative is opened to new voices, new experiences, and new perspectives. This is how we embrace inclusivity and actually learn from our past, rather than picking and choosing what we want to hear because it makes us feel like we are on the right side of history. By calling attention to the problems around the myths of the Underground Railroad, the prevalence of code words, secret hideaways, slave spirituals, and freedom quotes, I hope I have demonstrated the dangers in centering our understanding of the Underground Railroad around these narratives. Rather than completely throw these myths away entirely, museums and all educators should be conscious of how we use these tools, how we use these as tools to interpret the complex, difficult, high stakes history here acknowledge the exaggerations and embellishments, consider why local lore has grown in place of gaps in the historical record, and shift the focus onto the agency and experiences of the freedom seekers. In interpreting the history of the Underground Railroad at the St. Catharines Museum, and really all history, creating a dialogue is the most important. And it's not just us doing this work here. Museums, organizations, and organizers across Niagara are constantly striving to elevate Black history and Black voices in our community all year round. While there are many, I'd like to end tonight by naming one, Wilma Morrison. Wilma was a historian, an educator, and prolific force in amplifying Niagara's Black history. She passed away in April 2020 after a lifetime of tireless ad advocacy. Her voice and the voices of so many Black Canadians who can contribute to our understanding of history should not be overshadowed, overshadowed by myth and legend. Okay, thank you. Well done, Sarah, that was lovely. 
Thank uh, you so much. Excellently said. Um, before I conclude that, it reminds me of the, the saying that Black history is our history is Canadian history, or is Canadian history is our history. Uh, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. If you have any questions about tonight's presentation, you can post them in the chat box at the right-hand side or underneath uh, the screen, wherever, whichever uh, device you're using, a tablet, smartphone. Um, and you might not be able to see the chat box. So if you're having trouble finding the chat box, you can also put your questions in the comments section below. While we wait for questions and comments, thank you, much to, thank you so much to our viewers for attending tonight's lecture. And thank you all for your support. Uh, this season so far of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to, look, to deliver the high quality programming you expect from us. Every bit helps. So to make a donation, please again, call the museum at 905-984-8880 and leave us a message or send us an email at museum at stcatherines.ca. There are many lectures to watch. If you haven't watched them all already, if you have some catching up to do, uh, check out the playlist of lectures on our YouTube channel and share the play with, playlist with your friends and family. We'd also like to remind everyone to please like, follow, or subscribe on all our social media channels, including here on YouTube. If you haven't smashed that subscribe button, please do uh, to stay in the loop with all of our virtual programming during the museums, uh, during the, all, with all of the virtual programming. Uh, please also share the museum in your own social networks to help more of our community join in the historical adventures. And of course, if you love a deep, the deep dive nature of a lecture series, why not also try our podcasts? We have two podcasts, Museum Chat Live and One Hour in the Past. You can catch the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And uh, we, Kath, Kathleen and I just recorded uh, the first episode of series four of One Hour in the Past, and it's due to come out uh, next week, I think. And uh, so you don't want to miss that. It's quite excellent and we have a special guest. In fact, we have special guests for every episode this series. Finally, don't forget about our Black, uh, Black History Month programming. Uh, we'd love to see you for one of the, for the remaining tour coming up this Sunday at 4.30. See you at that time. <laughs> uh, and now we'll head to the chat box to take your questions and comments. Okay, let me scroll um, up. Sarah, can you, can you see them or do you want me to read them out for you? Um, I don't have them up anywhere. Oh, I guess. Okay, I will, uh, I will oh, wait, look Oh, wait, at... I, can, I can bring them up. I see them now. It's okay, I'll, I'll read them out. It gives me something to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, they're just a pretty face. All right, well, thank you very much for coming everyone tonight. It looks like there's a few people from across the country viewing with us tonight. I know at least, uh, Dave has said he's from Vancouver, but I know at least there's one other person watching from uh, BC. So uh, welcome to all those folks in other time zones watching with us either right now or uh, later. Uh, thank you so much for attending, and, and, and indeed, thank you to everyone here in Niagara attending as well, digging themselves out from all the snow that we got. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, the Canadian Federation of University Women, St. Catherine's Virtual Committee, says uh, this lecture was a nice compliment to Rochelle's discussion last time about visiting abolitionists. Uh, another uh, idea for a lecture would be a discussion of the BME Church, of course, that would be great, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots and lots of history about, actually not just the BME Church, but uh, religious organizations in the Black community, including the Zion Baptist Church as well. So um, that would be a really nice uh, lens to, to look at uh, that part of Black history uh, through. Mm -hmm. um, lots of thank yous, of course. Uh, Jerry says, thank you, Sarah, for a very informative lecture. I think we have to keep in mind that oral transmission events can easily lead to myths. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, there is value in, and this is, I think you said this in your uh, presentation, and, and I'm sure we all acknowledge that there is value in uh, oral history uh, and uh, stories from generations to generations. 
but uh, the challenge with that as sort of uh, historians is that they can e be easily uh, misused or, or um, uh, perhaps misrepresented in academic work uh, for the purpose of that person's academic work as your example with Dr. Siebert. So uh, the, it's not that we don't value oral history. In fact, we do value oral history. <laughs> for those of you who watched yesterday, uh, we are launching a new oral history project uh, at the museum. So we do value oral history, but the, uh, it, we always, as historians uh, and as sort of academics, we try to use that oral history with as many other sources as possible. Just good, good history practice, I guess. Um, absolutely, but great comment. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lots, lots, lots. Uh, great balanced lecture from Des. Very good, thank you, Des. Thank you. Um, oh, Rochelle's on the lecture. Hello, Rochelle. And she says, good job and thank you. Um, oh, hi, Rochelle, thank you so much for attending tonight. Um, uh, okay, and then, uh, and actually, uh, Rochelle, if you're still on, you can help us answer a little bit of this question as well from Dave Steele. Is there much left of the Black communities uh, homes in St. Catharines today. Uh, Sarah, do you have mm. um, the, the, there's a two chat and, and Rochelle, feel free to pop in um, if you're still there. Uh, the, there's, two, there's two challenges um, with, uh, oh, I remember coming across the ruins of a home near Finger Lakes Trail near uh, Ithaca, New York, some 30 years ago, there was a tunnel claimed to be where people hid for the day. Oh, neat. Um, I don't know how well that's good. <laughs> that's okay. I don't know about uh, your experience in Ithaca, but I will just talk about those two challenges of identifying perhaps homes or communities uh, in in sort of the, that were identified in Color Town is that uh, most of those buildings don't exist. The BME is a good example of a home or not a home, a building that exists from the period. Uh, but uh, if anyone's familiar with the area around Geneva and uh, uh, North Street or even uh, Raymond Street. Um, those, uh, there's lots, been lots of development in through the 60s and 70s. It's quite close to downtown. I know we talk about it as the outskirts. It was technically the outskirts in the 1850s and 60s, but it's quite close to downtown and it is subject to uh, lots of uh, development from the 60s, 70s and 80s. And unfortunately, a lot of the residences that would have been located on North Street, on Raymond Street, on uh, Geneva and in and around the BME Church um, have been raised a long time ago uh, and are now only just being replaced uh, or were replaced with parking lots, or for example, the new uh, police headquarters is being built on Welland Avenue, just behind the BME. Um, and, but Rochelle corrects me greatly. Thank you, I appreciate it, Rochelle. About 20 homes in the area still exist. So there is a challenge of, you know, these big high rise apartments, parking lots, uh, and then, you know, um, the uh, uh, sort of the, the buildings that exist from the period uh, being a, a challenge uh, in an urban environment that is constantly changing. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much um, for that question. I would, oh, and I would say, and Rochelle probably knows this more than I do as well, but the other challenge would be that, um, of course, some freedom seekers who perhaps lived in, in those properties moved away or sold them. Um, moved away either to return to the United States or moved away to other parts of St. Catharines and to the community. So if, uh, they may not have maintained ownership of those buildings for forever. Um, so that, that also complicates uh, the individual stories, uh, the individual stories of those particular buildings. But perhaps that's a lecture topic. <laughs> for the future. That's a very, very specific lecture topic. We'll write it down. <laughs> 20 homes in this area. Yes. No, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, it, and I see, you know, there's a little bit more conversation about, about it. Um, it is a little bit sad about how uh, our society uh, views heritage structures through different time periods in our city's ur urban development. So our particular view of heritage structures is different than it was 
say in the 1960s is very different from it was say in the 1930s. And so the treatment of buildings that were old at that time is a lot different from uh, how they are treated today. So that's just adding another layer on top. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Thank you very much everyone for uh, tuning in for tonight's lecture. A uh, special thank you to Sarah for another uh, well-researched and excellent lecture again, pr well presented, thank you so much. And uh, a very happy Black History Month to everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you, if not sooner than uh, March 2nd on March 2nd for our next lecture, uh, No Exit, <laughs> The Dead End Streets of St. Catharines. Thank you so much and good night, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay, ended.